Hi everyone, this is Niladri. Welcome to Project Management Professional Training uh, Session 5. So we have uh, gone through last four sessions on the fundamentals of project management. We have seen uh, things like what is a project, what's a program, what's a portfolio. Uh, we also have seen the different roles in a project. We have seen the five process groups in, uh, in the uh, project lifecycle for, for a waterfall project. We also have seen what happens in the initiation uh, or the initiating phase of a project, especially a business case, project charter, and so on. So we really have seen a good amount of things, I will say, uh, uh, on the basics of project management. Okay. Now, from this session onwards, we are going to step into the knowledge areas. I know it's a little bit uh, maybe a complicated uh, topic in your mind because you heard about process groups and now you're hearing about knowledge areas and you may not be knowing that are they like two disjointed topics or they are like same topic or what we are talking about process groups and what is the knowledge area and how they are connected. Don't worry, we will come to that and we'll explain to you in, in a crystal clear way that what exactly is the connection between knowledge area and the process groups. So our first knowledge area in which we are going to uh, uh, you know, come to or step into the session five is stakeholder management. So stakeholder management is the core topic of today's uh, lesson. And also we are going to have a look into uh, conflict management. So, all right, uh, let's dive in. First thing first, let's have a quick check on the assignment piece. So last session I shared with you guys a situation, uh, you know, where I spoke about this particular situation uh, to replace 200 storage servers globally along with certain amount of risk and constraints. And I wanted you all to write a business case and a project charter on that. I have not seen so far a mail or any kind of Slack or chime on this, but if any of you have written a draft format, that's absolutely fine. Uh, spend some time, it will not take more than 30 minutes to write a business case and maybe 30 minutes to write a project charter or maximum one hour. Let me know and we both can review it and we both can see you know how it how it looks. Because as a PMP certified professional, you are expected that you will be able to write business cases and project charter seamlessly. Okay. So have uh have a stab on that and and, and check you know how, how it works with you. Um, the other one which I wanted to share is definitely start your PMP exam application process. We are going to have very soon a complete hands-on on the entire exam application. Uh, flow along with the fee structure and how to apply. Basically, the application has got a very tricky part where you have to write your entire work experience in the language as a project manager. So that I will be helping you out if you have got any doubts there. Do not do anything in a hurry because if it gets rejected, then you again have to wait for one year to submit the application. Okay, so that's one more part, uh, but yeah, definitely, uh, uh, you know, give a try to the business case and the project charter. All right, exam content. Now, let's see what is in the PMP exam. Okay, do we, do we have got any, any particular categories or domains in the PMP exam? Absolutely, yes. So the PMP exam is being divided into three domains, or we can categorize the exam into three parts. One is people, one is process, and one is business environment. The people is like 42% of the questions you can expect from people, 50% of the questions you can expect from process, which is really great. Uh, the highest in the category and the business environment is the lowest with 8% of the question coming. And if you add them all up, like 42 plus 50 plus eight, it comes down to 100%. Now, let me share with you quickly, like what do we mean by people, process and business? And why are we not starting with people? Why are we starting with stakeholder management? I will come to that, okay? So by now, I believe that you all would have got a login or a registration done for the PMI website. Okay, it's simple, it will cost you no money, go ahead, it's a, it's, a, it's a free sign up. Once you have done that, then you go to exam certification, go to PMP certifications, basically. And there, if you scroll down, there are two options for you, which you must uh, download and keep a keep a soft copy with you. One is the PMP exam content online. This is the blueprint of the exam, okay? And this keeps on changing. So right now what I see it is uh, the last update was 2021 Jan, but things keep on changing. So if you're planning your exam after six months, eight months, uh, definitely have a look into this content outline. There should not be any surprises when you go to the exam, right? And certification handbook, yes, have a, have a check on this as well. It, 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 it talks to you about some detail on this certification. But first of all, exam content uh, or the blueprint of the exam. Now this one, 
here we have got the details. You will see Jan 2021 exam update, the last one. And it's a very well-structured, uh, just uh, 18, 20 pages uh, PDF file. Go through it line by line. And these are the domains which I told you, people, process, and business. They all add up to 100%. And these are the domains for the exam which you expect. Now, what are these? Let me just scroll down a little bit more. And you will see people, 42%. There are multiple tasks in each domain. So they are telling manage conflict, lead a team, support team performance. All these are uh, sub task in that domain. They are falling under the bracket people, but different uh, ways in which you manage people, right? So again, a project manager is not a people manager. However, a project manager is, I will say almost a people manager because people are reporting to a project manager in a dotted line while the time the project is going on. He's not a functional manager, of course, but he has he has got no authority of the people like, you know, hire, fire or something. However, he definitely will be having uh, control over the people or the resources while the project is going on. Okay, So definitely it it is the first initiating step of a leader, I will say. So multiple tasks, building a team, negotiating, collaborating, all that, go through them line by line. But these are the different uh, tasks which are falling under people, like 14 tasks. Now, if I get into a process, there are, which is like the highest in the in the domain areas, 50% of the question you expect from process, that is the key area. And if you're great in process, you are a solid PM. Okay, so process will be like scope, time, cost, communication management, all those things, engaging stakeholders, all that. Um, engaging stakeholders, you will see that analyze stakeholders, categorize, which we are going to do today. Okay, so why are we not taking this approach uh, like people and process and the the org areas rather than taking the approach of the knowledge areas. Because if you ask me, if I take you the, take, like take this approach, like let's, let's start with the lesson like manage conflict and then go for lead, lead a team. You will not be getting the entire essence of project management. So what, what is the best way to learn the project management, especially especially the waterfall? You have to go through the five process groups. What happens in initiating? What happens in planning? What happens in execution? What happens in monitoring control? What happens in closing? If you know that in detail, and if you've covered all the knowledge areas which are cutting across this process groups, let's say stakeholder management, uh, scope, time, cost, HR, quality, procurement, all this risk management, you will be knowing that these are automatically being covered. So after four or five sessions, when I come back and you will see, ah, oh, we have completed conflict management. Uh, we can have done the stakeholder management. And if you complete stakeholder management, automatically a lot of things will be completed uh, with respect to people. And of course, with respect to uh, managing the stakeholders and so on. Okay. So the proper way, if you ask me, is to go through the uh, flow of the project rather than learning it a task wise that will that may give you some knowledge but like i said the exam the questions will not be straightforward the question will be use cases and if you want to understand a use case nicely and get to the correct answer uh, you must understand the flow of the project management how a project flows from end to end okay uh, similarly you will be going down and there are like 17 tasks in the process. In the business environment, you will be seeing that we have got not much like compliance, uh, the threats to compliance, uh, the methods to support compliance, hardly four tasks, okay, support or change and all that. Now, these are easy. And these are easy means that you should be having a complete uh, you know, you know, grip on these topics. If you have got a good grip on these topics, uh, it's an easy uh, you know, uh, mark fetching questions for you. So 8% can be solidly like you can say, okay, 8% have taken, done. People also is kind of easier, but compared to process when you come, process is not that easy. Process, is, process questions can be tricky and they will test you to the neck, uh, which means that you have to know a detailed process and then and only then you can, uh, you can actually crack that question in the exam. And that needs a lot of practice, which will come to that later, okay? If you go down, then this is about the workflow about or the or the flow of the PMP application and payment. And then you have got other stuff there like application processes, how to write your exam application, I mean, PMP application, all that I will cover in the workshop and this, this all will be covered there. OK, also, we are going to cover in the same workshop about uh, the exam duration, uh, the, the number of questions. So when I gave my exam in 2014, that point of time, uh, we had no breaks. It was like a four hour straight exam with no breaks at all. You can take a break, but the clock will keep on ticking. 
if you come back. Um, so you basically lose time if you take a break, right? But now they have given two solid breaks and all that. So I will, I will, I will come to that in detail. Okay, when we talk about uh, application process, how to write, and also the uh, uh, exam content overview along with the uh, time or the uh, time management for the exam. Okay, uh, so that's about the uh, exam domains. And the reason I told you this is that because you guys should be knowing by now that what is the approach that we are taking in, in the uh, uh, content study? We are taking the classic approach, okay? Uh, and once you take the classic approach, you will be a master of the topics. And then it will be like the people process and the business is actually scattered across. You cannot pick only people process out of the out of the project flow. The project flow has got everything scattered, but the best way to learn it is through uh, process groups and knowledge areas. So let me come to the next slide. This is one of the most important slides so far, I will say. You can take a, a, a print screen of this or you can make a note of it. This is something which I will say, remember this always, okay? So let me uh, pick up an annotation tool and show you what I am talking here. Uh, pick up a good one. Okay, I got the arrow. Now, these are, so if I'm talking about the five process groups, five ones are initiating, planning, executing, monitoring control, and closing. So these are the, on the top row is the five process groups. The project, any project in the world, okay, be it IT project, be it, uh, uh, you know, a project in the automobile industry, aerospace, health, pharmaceutical, anywhere you pick up a project, if it's a waterfall project, it has to go through these five process groups. It cannot jump steps. And if it's a waterfall, it has to start from initiating and go to closing. Okay, so that's the standard format. Now then what are knowledge areas? So if you look below this process groups, all these rows, I have given some names here. So these names are the knowledge areas. We have got 10 knowledge areas. So integration management is one. Then we have got scope, time cost, or somebody tells scope, schedule cost, that's okay. We have got quality, we have got human resources, communication management, risk management, procurement management, and stakeholder management. Okay. Now. If you look into this carefully, all these knowledge areas which are there, they are scattered across these process groups, okay? There is only one and only one knowledge area which is cutting across all the process groups. Like throughout the project management life cycle of a waterfall project, you will find only integration management is the one which is cutting across through all the process groups, right? Now, why am I not starting with integration management? If you're thinking, then I will say that integration management, we will start after we complete a few of the core knowledge areas, then you will understand it. Because integration management should not be your first talking point. Integration management is a mixture of the knowledge areas, okay? And integration management is, is little complicated and, and it is one of the major reason why a project manager exists in a company. Because the project manager should be super smart in integration management. Now, if you look into the other knowledge area, which is very close to integration management, it is almost cutting across all the all the process groups, but apart from one group, uh, that is stakeholder management on the bottom. So stakeholder management is in initiating, it's in planning, it's in execution, monitoring control, but not in closing. Okay, so this is also a knowledge area which is pretty broad. I mean, initiating itself, if you remember, before even I wrote the project charter, I have to find out or I have to write down, or I have to identify the key stakeholders for the project. Because in the project charter, you have to include who are the key stakeholders. You do not have to include a very, uh, you know, uh, a consolidated or a comprehensive list there, but definitely have to give at least who are the, uh, you know, five people there who are key stakeholders, okay? And then once you formulate the project charter, let's say tomorrow your senior manager comes to you and hands you a project charter and says, okay, now you are the PM, you know, drive this project, then your first step will be that you don't say yes to that immediately, but you probably have to come and identify the stakeholders. You have to find out which teams you have to work with. You will be having some internal partner teams, you will be having some external vendor teams, and you have to find all the stakeholders and you identify them and you also find out how the stakeholders are, okay? Uh, and 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 you manage them. So that that managing the stakeholders, the initiating point at the starting point is called, you have to develop something called a stakeholder register. The register happens in initiating phase. And then you keep on evaluating or you keep on improving the register as you get into planning, as you get into executing. And remember, while the project is going on, some stakeholders may leave the company, 
some new ones can come or some someone can actually uh, you know join in from some other program into your project all that can happen so your stakeholder register is dynamic it will keep on changing till the time we come into monitoring and control and in the closing phase we are done with stakeholder management okay so that is why we will start with stakeholder management which is also a huge knowledge area which is like almost cutting through all the process groups but not closing apart from closing it is definitely going through all the other four process groups um, and after stakeholder management is done my plan is that we'll go through scope management schedule management and cost management these three are called the triple constraints because they are the key so the triple constraints are scope cost time and uh, we will see that you know how they are uh, you know coming up into planning and how they are being uh, monitored and controlled okay on a high level view uh, in the initiating phase you develop the project charter you develop the stakeholder uh, register okay do you develop risk management it's a great question actually do you develop risk management in the initiating phase because if you look into risk the risk management is actually starting in the planning stage that is when you develop the risk register right and you start off your planning however if the question in the exam comes, the answer is yes. We actually start off your risk in the initiating stage. If you remember project charter, a project charter will be including some high level risks into the charter. So definitely we actually kick off that risk or identify the risk, the high level risk in the beginning, but we are not including this because that's just a kind of, you will say a touching point, uh, but definitely the risk will be dive deep when the planning stage comes. But if the question in the exam comes that, do we do any kind of risk analysis or rather identification of risk? I will not say analysis, but identification of some high level risk during initiation. Answer is absolutely yes, because that's one of the input into the project charter. Okay. Uh, now planning stage, we definitely go for scope management, time cost. We develop a complete project plan with, which includes all these options and executing phase. We are not having any scope time cost, which are further to be developed because execution stage we are just following the plan right however monitoring and control is something where we are checking that is there a change in scope is there a change in schedule is there a cost a new cost coming up which we have not added or something not not buffered up so those kind of things we have to go back to the uh, change control board uh, if there is a baseline change Okay, and and finally the closing stage, you will see that none of the knowledge areas are touching the closing stage apart from integration management. Okay, that's kind of an overall view about um, uh, you know what we are uh, going to follow in the uh, course structure. So let's move forward. Stakeholder management. I will say a very vast topic. Okay, and when I talk about stakeholder management, I can just keep on talking on this one, but I will just cover the key things which you want to know. And again, here comes your, your hard copy, your book handy, your reference book. So whatever you have bought so far or planning to buy, uh, try to absorb as much as knowledge into the areas of stakeholder management, risk management, scope, time, cost. These five are the key areas. And if you have gained you know, a good amount of knowledge in these areas, uh, exam will be a smooth journey for you, okay? Now, why I said the science and art of project management on the top. Now, if you look into scope, time and cost, especially time and cost, or few of the other knowledge areas, they are plain mathematics, okay? Time and cost are absolutely pure mathematics. There is no gut feeling or there is no kind of intuition happening when you're calculating the schedule of a project or the cost of a project. But when you are doing, I'm sorry, it just moved, the slide just moved. So when you just, uh, uh, when you just uh, look into the stakeholder management, then it is both science and art. Yes, there is a little bit of mathematics involved in stakeholder management, some tried proven practice, but there is a lot of art into stakeholder management. And that art comes from experience. The more you engage with stakeholders, the more it, you will be able to, uh, you know, place a particular stakeholder into a particular bucket, okay? This is the bucket where the person looks like a kind of a resistant person or stubborn person. The person looks like supportive. All that will happen to you automatically uh, the more you engage with stakeholders. And that's why we say that, uh, you know, for large and complex projects, we need a PM with experience. Why we need a PM with experience? Not 
calculating the schedule and the cost. The schedule and the cost can be calculated by any PMP certified uh, in a project manager. Uh, and, and that will not need a lot of experience because those are all mathematical, like I said. Okay, if you know the mathematics, you can do it. And there are PM tools as well. If you, if you go to a tool like Microsoft Project, you can definitely calculate the schedule and cost. Okay, but will you be able to manage stakeholders with the help of a project management tool? You can purchase all the PM tools in the market, but you will not be able to manage stakeholders because that's that involves human art. Okay, and that involves experience. So your number of years you have dealt with people, necessarily not in a project, maybe you are an operations manager, but the number of years you have dealt with different kind of people that that helps you to make a better stakeholder manager. Okay, that is why we say the science and art. Now, stakeholders, let's see what they are doing here. So once you get the project charter, you identify the stakeholders. Let's say in, uh, in uh, CIS, let's say, let's talk about CIS here. Let's say in CIS, you, you are the PM and you are supposed to launch a day one project, okay? A 20 floor building you're supposed to launch. And you, you get the project charter. We are normally getting a, we are not normally getting a project charter or something here because it comes from the intake team and you are the delivery DPM here, right? But let's let's suppose for a while that, okay, initiating, you, you got the project charter to you and after that, what you do, okay? You identify the stakeholders. Maybe you're a very new guy, okay, in the CIS. So you definitely will take some time to know who are the people around you, right? Who can be your stakeholders? Definitely in, in day one, your, if you are from the TPM family, then an engineering person, the key engineer, the primary engineer for the project will be your stakeholder. The engineering team is your stakeholder basically, okay? The security team, uh, the AV team, uh, the internal procurement team, uh, all the vendors um, you know, outside, uh, the integrators, it can be the cable integrator, or it, it can be the AV integrator, all of these guys. Then you have got the telco designer, okay? Then you also have got the internal architect or the enterprise engineering team who can guide you with anything non-standard stuff, right? So all those things will be your stakeholder. I will tell you one uh, a quick uh, story here. Uh, 2017, uh, I will say, I was in IBM where I was managing a project for a big bank in Europe. And I was one of the 18 PMs in a very large program. Yeah, you heard it right, 18, one of the 18 PMs in a very large program. The program was for five years. Uh, when I joined that, you may believe it or not, I was jotting down the stakeholders. I was taking the complete uh, classic PMP approach and that really helped me to uh, succeed into that project. Uh, so it needed a very structured or organized approach. In the stakeholder list, uh, I, it took at least a week's time for me to get all these stakeholders. A, a lot many people from IBM, a lot many people from the client, and a lot many people from outside. Okay, and and uh, and basically it led to 103 stakeholders. I had to write down all their names in Excel sheet. I actually wrote it down with all their email address because if I want to call them for a meeting, I need their emails. If I want to drop a mail to them, I need their email, right? And also their phone numbers. Uh, we were not into too much of phone calls because all the guys, most of the guys, I will say 95% of the people who I was dealing with, they all were in Europe or they, they were in US, right? Very few people were in India, okay? So that's a structured approach you have to take, okay? So, so once you get real good into that, like CIS, Delivery TPM, have spent like a couple of projects you have done, you spent like six months, eight months, 10 months. After that, you kind of know the people very nicely, right? You know that, okay, these, these are the five, six teams I have to work with. But let's say that you are a new hire, then you will develop something. Now, uh, you always don't have to follow the PMP approach, a solid bookish approach, right? Okay, I have to create a stakeholder and without that, I cannot move forward. No, that's not the case. PMP gives you a very uh, structured approach. If you want to build a stakeholder register, then nothing like that, because that will be giving you a very organized way of, uh, of uh, working and managing the stakeholders. Uh, if you can do it, great. If you're not doing it in your current role, I will say still it is doable because you might have been in this role for some time and you know all the internal and the stakeholders or maybe you're talking with them day in and day out, right? You don't have to really create a new stakeholder. But something new comes up, I will always suggest strongly that build a stakeholder register. Now, for once, assume that you are a new hire and you have been given the project of launching a 20 floor building 
and you have divided that phase into the project charter itself. Three phases you are going to launch that building. Phase one is MDF and phase two and three will be IDFs. And you are maintaining or you identified all the stakeholders and you developed a project stakeholder. Now what after that what? Now you might be asking, okay, I wrote all the names and I wrote all the email address and I wrote their roles and everything in a Excel sheet. Now what? One of the things which you have to do, one of the elements of the stakeholder management is that it's not just about uh, jotting down names and email address. I mean, that's one of the admin jobs which you have to do because if you want to call them to a meeting or drop up them a mail, you have to know their contacts and their roles as well. But the other part is that we call something called stakeholder engagement assessment metrics, SIM. SIM means that there are five categories of stakeholder, unaware, resistant, neutral, supporting, and leading. From left to right, if you look into the diagram, which I have shared with you, okay? Now, these are the five categories of any stakeholder of any project in the world. Okay, no stakeholder is above or beyond or right or left of these categories. They will fall into these categories only, okay? Now, how do you know that? You will know that either by you, when you start off your meetings or when we, when we go to them, like let's say, this building, 20, like 20 floor building I'm talking about, let's say in the building you have to have at least uh, 20 non-standard labs, okay? And let us suppose that you are the TPM and you are going to capture the lab requirements. I'm just trying to take off the intake team now. I know that intake does that. Let's, let's suppose that you are going to talk to the stakeholders and capture the lab requirements. So no more detail about the labs, right? You go to the lab owner, the lab owner is not coming to your meetings. They're not joining your meeting. Okay, you start a kickoff call, you see that most of the key people are not joining. Or maybe one of the senior engineer is not joining or one of the primary engineer is not joining your call. Okay, and even one stakeholder is actually, they don't even know. I mean, you go and talk to them, hey, this building will do this. It's, it's the first state of the art building happening. They may not be knowing also. Some of them will be resistant. Okay, so what is your role here? First thing is that, the best option to engage with the stakeholder is always face-to-face, -face, in person. If you can do that, then nothing like that, okay? Because you, you know the body language, uh, you know the move, the movement of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the eye contact happens, the movement of hand, eyes. So basically, you, you, you can gauge a person very easily. How much interest is there, okay? How much of attention is there, right? In person is the best. If you cannot do it in person, then definitely will pick up the phone and talk. I, I always say that pick up the phone and talk. That's the next best, best option. If those two options are not there, then you have to get into a virtual meeting like a Chime or a Slack and try to do a video call there because in video you see each other. And in the first or second meeting only, you should be able to gauge that the stakeholder is unaware of your project. Okay, which is fine, which is okay. Sometimes people are not aware of a project, right? And it is your job to make them knowledgeable, to educate them. Are they knowing your project and they're resistant to it? Because they might be telling, ah, you know what? We don't need this 20 floor building launch, okay? It's kind of a waste of time. Or they may also say that, uh, why, are, why aren't we doing some automation? Or before the building happens, why are we not solving this project, which is lying for a long time? Why are we getting our strength into that building? That also can happen, okay? Third one is neutral, where neutral is the most dangerous, okay? I don't know if you have uh, read the book uh, Inferno by Dan Brown. Uh, the, the, the starting quote is by Dante, right? Where he says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are not taking a side during times of crisis, um, positive or negative, you know, uh, uh, hell is the place for them. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a very strong line, but I say that neutral people are the most dangerous because you don't know what they are, uh, uh, you know, and you also don't know that what tricks they are having there, there uh, are they having on their sleeve, right? Because neutral are the guys who you don't know if I educate them, will they come up or are they resistant or are they supporting? They will not show their true color, okay? So there are ways to engage, okay? At any point of time, I will always say that do not escalate things, okay? Uh, do not the escalation will be your last point because escalation burns bridges escalation is not the good way that you copy their manager your manager drop a mail why are you not joining my meeting okay that is something you should not be doing you try to influence the person try to reach out to the person and say what can i do for you is the is the meeting time not correct for you 
or are you very busy or maybe do you have a delegate who can join my meeting on behalf of you all that works fine maybe the person is traveling too much you never know right but it is not a good idea or a good thought that based on a couple of behaviors you escalate things and then his manager your manager talks and things will be a little bit you know um i will not say out of control but the bridges the the bonding between you and this person will break so that's not the way to go uh you will be going that way if if really after a couple of reminders, gentle reminders, you try to reach out, things fail, then probably will go to your boss and say, you know what, I'm not able to, before writing a mail, you will talk to your boss and say that, hey, you know what, I'm not able to get the, get this person into the meeting room. Um, and, and he's one of the key person without his uh, thoughts and ideas will not be able to move forward, right? Maybe he's a lab owner. Now, if the lab owner is not contacting you or getting in touch with you, there is some problem and you don't know what's the problem, right? So neutral is a dangerous phase. And then there are two very, very positive sides of stakeholders supporting and leading. That happens in every company. You know, companies will be having three kinds of people, I always say. First part is people who will always uh, appreciate you. Okay, you are, you are doing very good. People who will always try to take the credit away from you that, you know why he's doing good? Because I only taught him that. Okay, and the third uh, you know, a uh, uh, class of the people will be who will be ignoring you. Like, okay, whatever he has done, good or bad. Okay, so there are three kinds of people, and 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 the first, if you are getting stakeholders who falls in the first category, you are supporting that, or who are, who are even leading things from their end. I will say, amazing, awesome. Now, here is also one more thing. I, you will see a C and a D, right? Below resistant, I have given a C below neutral. So there is one way which I used to manage in my time. C means what is the current state of the person? I used to put a, like, like in the stakeholder raised in the Excel sheet, I will keep a column like C and a column like D. So I will keep like current state of the person is resistant and my desired state is, let's say neutral. Okay, why I'm not putting a desired state to be supporting because it is, unrealistic impractical you cannot push a person from completely resistant to a supporting right you have to bring him to neutral first okay he is no longer resistant that also is a very positive sign okay he has come to neutral but but you really uh, will will not be seeing uh, i mean or that will be very rare that a completely resistant person falls into the supporting that that doesn't happen much, right? So keep some realistic goals with you that, okay, I, I, I can push my unaware guy to maybe a neutral or supporting because unaware you don't know. Maybe he was not knowing about the project. He was on a holiday or something. He came back, he got to know from you and he may immediately fall into the supporting group. But resistant means that he already knows about the project. He or she already knows about what, what this project is all about. They would have maybe also seen the project charter, right? But they're resistant. That means they have got something which is withholding them or something which is not falling, or what you would say in the in the common line, like what's in it for me, okay? And they may not be seeing something for them in the project. And if that is the case, they will be resistant, okay? Or maybe they have got some hidden agenda, which you don't know, okay? Um, there are many hidden, uh, like, uh, like stuff or many uh, hidden agendas which are worked on by stakeholders, especially if it's an influential stakeholder, maybe he or she had a hidden agenda that, uh, if this project was being led by me, then I could have gone some credit, which could have helped me to move up to my next uh, aspirational role or whatever, right? So those things are there. And that way, that's why the person may not be happy that you are leading the project. This all can happen. Okay, and these are very common you know, situations I'm telling you. So always keep a track, like what is the current state of the person? Okay, is it resistant? And what is the desired state? But desired, don't keep it, uh, unrealistic state like a raised and cannot be jumped to a leading. If you are a new project manager, new in the company, definitely take help of your program manager or your immediate manager because this is where your manager will be coming in with experience and can, can guide you a lot in this area. Okay, so that's how we call it a scene matrix. Now, once you have identified the people, okay, who falls where and what is your current state and desired state, there are different ways in which you can manage or prioritize influencing the stakeholders. So, so we have got a very common way of doing that. Some people do it, some don't do it because with the flow of time, with the flow of projects, they unknowingly do it without following this. But most of us do it without actually knowing that what, what this is called. This is called a power interest grid. So if you look into that, uh, power is on the right side, the y-axis and the x-axis is interest, which means that uh, let's say 
I have got a person with high power and high interest into the project. Maybe your uh, sponsor, right? A sponsor is a great example who has got a high power and a high interest into the project. So how do you manage a sponsor? The answer is in the fourth bracket. You manage closely, right? Anybody who has got a high power and a high interest in the project, you will be managing them closely, which means that you will be giving them uh, you know, updates regularly. If there is a change, you will go to them, talk to them and bring this change. If there is any diversion, any baseline stuff, uh, changes going on, you will go and talk to them and keep them always apprised and you will manage them closely. If they have got the requirement change or they want to have something else going on, you give them more demos to that. Uh, here in the lab, you may not be able to give a demo till the time things are completely launched. But what I'm trying to say, let's in a product development, uh, you need to give uh, you know demos. And that's why when we do sprints, when I talk about Agile, uh, out of the four layers in, layers in Scrum, uh, uh, you know, one of the layers in Sprint is that you do a demo, a retrospective and prior to that, a demo to the customer. So demo keeps you very close. So managing closely is one of the key areas when the customer is or the stakeholder is high power, high interest. And similarly, you will see the other blocks here. And we are actually following this in a real life, but maybe you not be knowing that it is called a power interest grid. A person who has got a low interest, okay, uh, which, which falls in this category and a low power, you keep them informed, right? Similarly, uh, low interest, uh, sorry, uh, uh, low power, but high interest will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, minimum effort you, you, you want to give them. And a high power candidate with a low interest will be coming into, uh, keep satisfied because high power means that they are having enough. I mean, they have got enough impact and influence on the project. Okay. They can seize the funding to the project. Uh, they are a part of the change control board. Okay. Uh, that person is your immediate senior, uh, your, in your uh, org, the, the person is a senior VP. Okay. All this will keep the person in a high power group. High power group can be either highly interested or they may not be having too much of interest, but they're in the high power. If it is high interest, you manage them closely. If it is low interest, but high power, you keep them satisfied. Whatever they want, you give it to them. Okay, try to give it to them. If you cannot, then you can explain to them. But when the power is a little bit going down, power is on the low category and the interest is high, you keep them informed, okay? Uh, power low, but interest high. Okay, there are many people, uh, maybe people at the bottom of the group. Uh, okay, maybe a technician, okay? high interest, but low power. And uh, power is low and the interest is low as well. Okay, then it's a monitoring, just a monitoring and a minimum effort. Okay, so these these are the things which we are already doing. Uh, it's nothing new to us, uh, but maybe you are not knowing the name of this. That's called a power interest grid, uh, which is one of the techniques used by project managers to ensure that they're effectively managing their stakeholders as per their, their, their uh, influence and impact. Okay. All right, now we come to stakeholder register. This is a very, you know, a kind of a, a, a rough, I will say a high level screenshot of how a stakeholder register looks. Uh, it don't have to be exactly like this, but the key things which should always be in a stakeholder register are the name of the stakeholder, the contact email and phone number, if both you can get, it's, it's great. The role of the stakeholder, Okay, the impact and the influence if you want to add, great. And if you also want to add the current state of the stakeholder and the desired state of the stakeholder, like C and D, which I, which I showed you, that, that will be a very good option to add it here. You can also have some expectations, some requirements, some concerns with the stakeholder and all that. And you can keep on developing it. And as you get into planning stage or execution stage, the stakeholder register will evolve. Some people will move out and all that stuff will happen. You may not be seeing this in Amazon too much, uh, at least in CIS. Uh, but if you are a, if you are in a service-based company where um, the project is funded by the client, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about external projects, right? Uh, a day one launch will be an internal project. The project is funded by your cost center or the cost center you belong to, or maybe the business, okay? but But, for an external project, let's say I work in IBM for a bank in uh, Europe, then the then the bank is going to fund my project, and 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 I'm going to have a project code. So every week I fill up a weekly timesheet with the project code, and that's how my uh, salary comes into my account. Okay, I have to prove that I have worked for uh, 
you know, minimum 40 hours in that project or as per the agreement in the contract, right? So if you have worked in that environment, you will know that what I'm talking, um, your stakeholder re you know, register will keep on changing. The key people may not change, the project sponsor and a couple of people, your delivery, your, de your de delivery PM will be one from your side, let's say IBM, and one from the banking side also, delivery PM will be there, okay? And the delivery PM of the banking side or the customer side, they will be checking uh, is the deliverables what they wanted, okay? What was like written in the project charter. Okay, that they will verify and the user testing will be done done from IBM end, done and dusted. And then again, the delivery TPM or the delivery PM from the uh, customer end, like the bank, they will also do a complete UAT a testing. And then they will say, okay, this is the software which we wanted. This is exactly what we asked for and what IBM has given. Because then they will call the project as a uh, proper closure. Okay, what happens if you are not able to deliver the items on time? Okay, let's say you told I will give you everything by 1st of Jan 2024 and you delay that. Again, you have to follow the contract. The contract may say that for every day of delay, a penalty is there. Okay, then again, the uh, the company which is providing the product here, IBM, has to pay a penalty to that particular uh, client like the like the bank here, if there is a delay. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, penalties are there, a lot of strict clauses are there if you're working for an external project, okay? For internal projects, probably you just, uh, you know, talk to your business and if they all agree, then you rebaseline the project without any changes maybe or, or any penalties in terms of cost and all that, right? But external customer, uh, uh, it will be a little difficult. It will be as per the contract which you both, uh, which you both guys signed on in the beginning of the project. Okay, and that all happens even prior to the project charter, the contract gets signed off, right? So stakeholder register is something where you can plan it out and place it. Like I said, for CIS, you may not need it, need for every project a stakeholder register, but if, it, if, if you're a new person or the project is a brand new kind of a project, which you have not seen in the past, definitely go ahead and build up a stakeholder register. It will help you to keep control on the project. All right, conflict. See, now we are coming to that people and the task one, right? People and the task one is about conflict. Okay, now imagine I started this as my very first topic in the lesson and without getting our hand and feet into stakeholder management, I talked directly about conflict management. You would have learned something of course, by, by, but you would not have got the entire story, right? So one of the core areas of stakeholder management is also conflict management. Whenever I talk about stakeholder management, I have to talk about conflict management, right? A project manager is, is not a people manager, but definitely he or she should have the capability to handle conflict and conflict will keep on happening in the project. Now let's look at the top reasons for conflict. The common to contrary myth, one of the myths I have seen which people have caught is that personality is a top reason for conflict. And it is not. As per as per the statistics and as per PMP guidelines, you will see in the bottom of the list, we have got the personality. The starting, the top reason for conflict is always schedule, followed by project priorities and resources. If somebody tells what are the top three reasons for conflict, always go with schedule, project priorities and resource. And then we have got the other human factors like cultural, technical, personality comes at the end or at the bottom. It is not the reason for conflict. Okay, so give you an example. Schedules, why schedule is a conflict? Because if you are engaging multiple teams there, let's say for a day one site launch, you're engaging multiple partner teams, right? And uh, and there will be a direction from their team to engage into some other project at that point of time. So if your partner team is being directed by their leadership to engage, let's say the, let's say the security guys are told to engage into something else, they will not be able to, able to help you out on your day one launch, right? Then and you have got something to roll out. So if you are not having a proper uh, goal like together, then you will not be able to uh, meet up. And that's when the conflict rises, right? That when, that's when uh, at a high level of conflict is there and schedule at, the, at a lower level also, which the PM can solve. Something like, you know, uh, your schedules for different teams are not matching, okay? Uh, project priorities. The projects can get deprioritized or reprioritized at any point of time. Like we have seen currently in the unfabric migrations. What we have seen, we have seen that uh, due to RTO, a couple of the uh, standalone migrations got a little bit deprioritized, right? And we are not doing any standalone migrations, at least in the month of April, uh, because we are 
fully engaged in uh, not we but basically the uh, uh, the net dev guys they 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 are very much engaged into rto activities which is happening from um, 1st of may so these are the project priorities can happen and these has these can lead to a con like conflict this cannot because this was kind of uh, not a conflict because we knew that it's a very uh, strong direction from senior management and we all kind of agreed on that but let's say the direction is not there very clear some companies may not give that kind of a direction there will be internal bottom or lower level kind of conflicts that why are we doing this now why it was not told to us earlier so project priority when you deprioritize or reprioritize a project that definitely will lead to conflict resource you might be knowing this by now if you have done a couple of cis day ones you know resource is definitely a cause of conflict you may not be getting a local id at, on time you may not be getting or what we say the on-prem support team on time and i'm not trying to blame anyone what i'm trying to say is that there may be multiple genuine reasons that that person was not available for that day or after business hours but that definitely leads to conflict right so any of these reasons are not like uh, non-genuine or falsified they all are genuine reasons okay and this is throughout not only amazon but any company you go or any project to do these are the top reasons for conflict for any project some of them will be beyond the control of the pm okay and for that the pm then has to take a consultation from their boss or the senior manager of the portfolio or the sponsor okay uh, but some of them will definitely be in the control of them so now let's see the resolution conflict techniques very useful for the exam and this is some where you you can really uh, uh, you know get some questions quickly done uh, why i want to say quickly done because exam the time management is very important once i get into the time management of the exam you will actually see that you don't have too much time to crack a question you have got limited time in fact very less time to read one question and find the correct answer so you have to be very thorough with this. So first of all, know that what are the kind of conflicts, which is uh, should be easy by now. And then what are the techniques to resolve a conflict from the perspective of a PM? I'm not talking from the perspective of a, uh, from a portfolio manager or somebody senior, right? We have got five ways, withdraw, avoid, smooth or accommodate, compromise or reconcile, force direct and collaborate or problem solve. Now. Let's go through them one by one and see. So withdraw or avoid is not a very effective way. Withdraw or avoid means that you see that there is a flurry of emails going on maybe with, with one of your project team members and maybe with some other partner team, right? And it is getting into escalation point, right? And you don't do anything. You just step away from that, okay? It is, it is kind of you think the problem will automatically resolve. Okay, now this is this is only useful in the cases where the stakes are low and where, uh, you know, there is not too much of risk there. Like if you don't take an action or don't command, then the stakes will be low. Uh, take an action, then this will work out. Okay, and the, and the conflict will automatically get sorted. So withdraw or avoid is a technique which is the least effective and should be used only when the stakes are low and uh, and and when there is a chance that yeah because the stakes are low uh, the impact is low uh, the blast uh, uh, will be low uh, then if you step out of that chances are very high that will get automatically sorted okay but if the blast radius of uh, that particular issue which is being talked about or conflicted about rather uh, if that is high then this will not work out so least effective is withdrawal you, you can take this chart like something least effective to highest effective okay smoothening or accommodating now this is something which is uh, i will say uh, you know this this is something to avoid a tough discussion okay a conflict is happening um, and uh, the the pm wants to avoid the tough discussion tough discussion can be uh, you know you do not have a resource there um, uh, so what to do? Can we hire a resource? And the hiring is something like the other manager says that who will pay for the hiring if his you know, a partner team says that we don't have the budget for hiring. So all that, the PM will try to smoothen out. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll try to avoid and a temporary fix can be done. Okay, let's share a resource from some other team who has got a similar kind of a skill and let's get the job done and then we can release him. Okay, this also works out when the stakes are low and when... Um, and 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 when the pm tries to avoid a difficult or a tough conversation 
Okay, so these two are not very effective methods. Now let's come to compromise. Compromise is something when, I mean, if you think in real life also, when you're compromising, then you and the other person who you both are compromising, then it is a lose-lose kind of a situation for you both because you're winning on something. Of course, you're gaining ground on something. Uh, see, in any kind of conflict, there will be some area where you both will agree and some area where you both will disagree, right? So compromise is something where you are, you are, trying to uh, have a gain on few areas and the other person is having a gain on few areas. But ultimately you both are losing out on few areas. Okay, so compromise is something where I will say it's a lose-lose kind of situation. Okay, compromise is sometimes done when, like I said, when it's a contractual with a client and uh, unavoidable situation has happened. Let's say a natural disaster has happened. A data center was supposed to be built. Earthquake happened. By that time, all the money went. And compromise may be that the, you are asking more time and the client is telling, okay, can we shift the location? So you both agree on something. Okay, not the same location, but let's have more time. So something on that. It's, it's not a very very long-term kind of a solution, but it's, it is not to be taken much because it will it will both the parties will lose something there. Okay. Force or direct, very direct, or I mean, the wording only says force or direct is something where it's a win-lose. One person wins, one person will lose. So conflict happens and, uh, and the PM steps in. Force direct, if you, if you are taking in a team meeting with a partner and you take the side of the partner or your team, any which ways you take, any other party whose side you have not taken, they will feel demotivated. Okay, so be very careful when you're taking a force decision. Sometimes you have to take force decision. Sometimes you have to take your, uh, you know, uh, 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 your uh, PM authority to, to take the final call, the final decision. Okay, let's say you're hiring a candidate. Okay, now here we know that how we hire the candidate. We have a, got a panel and we've got a very structured approach. Uh, some companies may not be having that kind of a structured approach, right? And and there, uh, maybe all this voting and et cetera will not be done. It's more or less like, a uh, senior person can say, this is kind of a known guy to me, take him in the team. And and uh, it's kind of a forceful thing to you uh, from the senior program manager to you. And probably you have to, you have to say yes, um, because a person is taking the executive call on that particular decision. Okay. But it's a force always leads to like, one is winning and one is losing. So, so these all have got some problems, like withdraw is like only for low risk, smooth is, uh, when you try to avoid uh, tough discussions, uh, compromise, you both are losing. Force is one win, one lose. The best is collaborator problem solve. In fact, the bottom line is that in the conflict resolution, uh, if you're taking the approach of problem solving and if you're collaborating with the people who are conflicting together, uh, then that is the best way of resolution of conflicts because nobody feels that they are left out. Nobody feels they are lost. You are deeply engaged with people. You're collaborating together, trying to solve the problem, trying to look at the problem and not the person rather. And that is one of the best ways to um, resolve a conflict. And this all again comes with experience. It is not like day one, you read a PMP book and you go to a company, start working and you start thinking, shall I do collaborate? Because in some or the, some of the, uh, in the situations, your forts direct a compromise may work well. But I told you the pros and cons of each of them. All right, now coming down to next steps, uh, let's wrap up. Uh, let's go through the points quickly. Stakeholder register is developed during initiation stage and it continues still monitoring and control. Uh, stakeholder mapping, one of them I have seen, I have shown you is the power interest grid that helps the PM to prioritize the efforts for stakeholder management or engagement. Um, Schedule and project priorities are top reasons of conflict and the personality and, and the personality is the bottom most reason. Uh, collaboration is the most effective method of conflict resolution. All right, with that, we came to the end of lesson five. Thank you for watching this. I enjoyed uh, and I, I, I hope you uh, liked the video um, and uh, share your comments and feedback over email or Slack or Chime and let me know if you need to know any further uh, uh, content on these topics. Thank you very much. Wish you all a great day and a great time. Cheers.